what we cannot understand will be known in its time oh, His word is as sure as the rising sun who set our feet in the steps of the matchless world oh shout when the lord has given us a city oh shout let his praises be sung let the walls fall down let the walls fall down his promise is forever oh shout has overcome what we cannot see can be hopeful what we can word is as sure as the rising sun set our feet in the steps of the matchless world oh shout the Lord has given us a city oh shout let his praises be so let the walls fall down the walls fall down, His promise is forever. Oh, shout, He has overcome. The ground on which we stand is holy ground. With our face to the earth, we bow before Him now. This holy ground With our face to the earth bow before Him now To worship To worship The Lord has given us city. Oh, shout! Let His praises be sung. Let the walls fall down. Let the walls fall down. His promise is forever. Oh, shout! He has overcome. Oh, shout! He has overcome. Welcome. We are so excited to, that you are all here to worship together this morning. Our scripture reading today is from Joshua 6. We're going to be reading verses 16 through 18. If you have your Bibles, you can open it up and read along. And at the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you this city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, Blessed, when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. To begin our time this morning, I'm going to ask us to stand up and greet the people beside you and welcome them.
Thanks, y'all. You can be seated. Well, we have the opportunity today to launch out um, our new life group leaders. We have um, another group of people who have said yes um, and who have felt the Lord stirring their hearts to want to form new life groups. So let's watch the video together, and then we will pray over these leaders. As followers of Christ, we're called to go out and make disciples of Jesus everywhere. It's in the weekly meetings of life groups where we gather in community around God's word and in prayer to grow our faith through Christ-centered, authentic relationships. We have men's groups, women's groups, and mixed groups. We aim to love one another by using our gifts to serve, stir, and send out one another as we live for Jesus Christ in everything that we do. When we gather together in groups, we are bringing worship to that neighborhood, coffee shop, or meeting place. Our vision is to establish worship in every neighborhood around us. And with every new group, we are working toward achieving that purpose. If you are not in a group, I want to encourage you to consider joining one of these new groups or reaching out to us at lifegroups at 121cc.com. We can help you find a group that is a good fit for you. Now, let's meet the leaders who have been called by God to start new groups so we can pray with and for them. Mayeli Alarcon. This is a women's life group for Spanish speakers who are looking to grow together in the knowledge of God's word and in community. It will begin with group exercise to allow the body and mind to de-stress and get hearts ready to receive from the Lord. It will be a place for women to experience God right where they are in life. Jeff and Crystal Butler. This is a mixed life group for couples in their 30s to mid 50s that meet Tuesday evenings in Flower Mound. This is a group looking to build authentic relationships for couples that help one another grow in their marriages and grow in their relationships with Jesus. Sam and Danielle Smith. This is a group for young married to nearly married couples looking to start their marriages off on a strong foundation of Jesus and community. The group will strive to help each other learn more about God's word and more about how to live out God's calling for marriage. Doug Miller. This is a men's group that will meet during lunch to study God's word and focus on how they can live out their faith in the workplace. They will strive to encourage one another to faithfulness in every area of their lives. Whether you're working in an office, virtually, in a hybrid role, or work from home, this group will tackle the challenges and opportunities the work environment provides. This is an easy opportunity to invite people from your workplace for meaningful conversation. Brett Petkus. This is a men's group that meets in Colleyville, striving to help each other be the men that God has called them to be. This group will study God's word deeply and hold each other accountable to live it out in their lives. Chad Ray and Derek Bennett. This is a mixed life group for families in Southlake on Thursday evenings. This group strives to leverage their life stage and activities to create community for those who struggle finding it in the busyness of life. Rebecca and Robert Deaton. This is a mixed group where all ages and stages are welcome. They want to help build up community by studying God's word and meet to pray and encourage each other in their daily lives. Knowing a life centered on Christ is the most rewarding thing. Steve and Cassidy Doolittle. This is a mixed life group for families with elementary to high school age children. Their hope is to grow together in their faith by studying God's word and connecting with other people. Jana Knoll and Carol Ann Risser. This is a women's life group for moms of school age children. The goal for the group is to learn from each other and grow deeper in their relationship with God as they make a difference in their community by praying for their schools, children, and each other. Jessica Marchetti. This is a life group for women in their early to mid 20s. They will come together in God's word to pray for each other and to create community as they navigate this particular stage of life. Christy McFarlane, this is a women's life group that will build a community based on authentic friendships and a love for God's word. Women of all ages and stages are welcome. We live in a busy and distracting world, but God is generously and consistently speaking to us through his word. Joy Roberts, this group is designed to allow women, especially those who work outside the home, to grow in their love and worship for God. We find our identity in Christ, even as women who struggle to do it all. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we thank you for all of these leaders, Lord. We thank you, God, and for how you have stirred their hearts, and we thank you um, that they are stepping out in faith. I pray, Lord, that you would lead them. Um, I pray, God, that you would reveal your plans to them, Lord, and I pray um, that you would use them. I pray that you would gather people to them, and in their gatherings, that their hearts would be stirred, Lord, that they would um, walk in intimacy with you, that they would um, submit to you, Lord, that they would see your goodness all around them, Lord. We pray more than anything that you would be glorified as they prepare, that you would be glorified as they meet, Lord, that you would be glorified as their group members go out and share the good news of Jesus. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a table that you've prepared for me In the presence of my enemies it's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battle There's a table you prepare for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battle. And I believe you've overcome and I will lift my song of praise for all you've done. Cause this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. Surely, your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my battles.
is how I fight my battles. This 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 is how I fight my I think that song captures well the way that God has called us to uh, engage the battles that we have in life. And uh, often the way God has us do things is really counterintuitive to how we might think we would go at it. God's really unusual in his battle plans for us. And, and that song really sums it up, that the way we go to uh, battle in life uh, is with God in praise and gratitude. In the Psalms, uh, all throughout the Psalms, the psalmist has been uh, attacked by a variety of enemies. He has all kinds of trouble in his life. Uh, And again and again, he talks about the praise, the gratitude towards God, being surrounded by songs of deliverance and the presence of God, that that the way to engage life's battles is through the presence of God in prayer with him. If you turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 6, Uh, We've been working our way through Joshua these last few weeks. We'll continue to do so uh, for the remainder uh, of the fall, the bulk of the fall. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you today, uh, we'll have the scripture on the screen uh, as well, so you'll be able to follow. I I know throughout the semester, once we do a book study like this, that uh, people come in and out, people are new today, uh, and it's why I do a recap. For, For you that are here every week, you're thinking... I keep hearing the same thing with one little addition each week, Uh, but we do that just to make sure we all catch context uh, of what we're speaking of. If we just jumped into something, uh, it might be hard uh, for someone to grab hold of of why this is occurring. So just quick context of what's happening before we get to Joshua 6. Uh, In the beginning of Joshua, uh, we learn that Moses, who had led the people for decades, the children of Israel, had died. Uh, And it was next up, time for the next leader. Joshua had been with Moses. Joshua was the one chosen uh, to be the leader and to actually fulfill the promise God had made centuries before to take the people into the promised land. And he gives Joshua a promise. He's very clear. He says, every place that the sole of your feet touch, the land will be yours. And Joshua goes in with confidence, knowing that God is with him, uh, what he's spoken to Moses, Uh, and that this land has been promised for the people. So leadership transfer is complete, uh, and now Joshua begins 
what will be the conquest of the land for Israel. Chapter 2 of Joshua, we run into an unusual scene with uh, an unlikely person, a a prostitute uh, that God uses uh, to bring about clarity that he has given the land. uh, And this prostitute Rahab hides the spies, takes care of them. In exchange, she'll be spared. And we come back to Rahab in chapter 6 of Joshua today. Chapter 3, they cross the Jordan River. Chapter 4, they memorialize that moment. And then in chapter 5, we find ourselves in transition, some final things that need to happen before they'll cross into the land. That catches it up to chapter 6. Uh, I always try to find what is, at least in my mind as I study, uh, a primary theme that runs through what the message will be for for the day. And and when I think about today, I think about unusual plans for life battles. Every one of us face battles in life. Uh, We'll have battles today. Uh, It's only a matter of degree uh, of what those battles are. It's not a matter of if we'll have them Uh, It's to what degree uh, that we will have them, and then how we'll actually face them. And and I think we find some really good ways to be a help for us uh, as we tether ourselves to Joshua 6 in what were very unusual battle plans in this chapter, and God might have really unusual ways that he has for us to battle the things that are in our own lives. There's two things that will fall under that idea today. One is understand the plan, and two is execute the plan. So often we understand the plan, but we don't execute it. Therefore, it really doesn't matter that we understand the plan if we're not executing the plan. You know that in your work settings. You know that here's a plan. Somebody's bringing the plan, and they expect you in your job to execute the plan. If you don't execute the plan, it doesn't matter that you can say back to them, you understand the plan, You want to execute the plan. Same in Joshua 6. God gives an understanding of the plan. We see execution of the plan. And then we'll bring it to our context and say, okay, how does this fit with us today? Let's begin in chapter 6, verse 1, understanding the plan, first five verses. Now, Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. We know from the earlier chapters of Joshua that the people in the land, their hearts had melted and they had no courage before the people of God as they were coming. They'd heard what God had done. They'd heard his power and his might, and they shrunk in their hearts and in their courage. Paralyzed by fear, they shut themselves in Jericho. They didn't let anybody out, and they didn't let anybody in. Let me take a look at Jericho so we can understand a little better what's happening. In Israel, which is this side of the river, the blue line, at the bottom of the map is the Dead Sea. Flowing into the Dead Sea is the Jordan River. If you look up the river at the city called Adam, That's what we learn in Joshua is the place where God stopped the water so that the people of Israel could cross the Jordan River on dry ground. It was about 20 miles up from Gilgal. Gilgal, we read about in Joshua 5. That word Gilgal means to roll away. And it was named Gilgal because they had had the disgrace of their slavery in Egypt rolled away from them. I think that's a pretty cool picture looking ahead at what Jesus did for us at the cross. And he rolled away the disgrace of our sin in taking that sin on himself. At the moment where we are in Joshua 6, they're camped at Gilgal. Jericho, a little bit to the left of Gilgal, is five miles west of the Jordan River. And it's about seven miles west north and west, up from the Dead Sea. So that at least helps orient what's happening. And Jericho would be the key strategic city, the first city that would be taken as they begin their march on the land. Now Jericho is the lowest city 
in the world. It's about 800 feet below sea level, and it's also one of the oldest cities in antiquity uh, today. It was called the City of Palms. It was an oasis uh, where people would go. Even if you were there today, you'd see some palm trees uh, throughout. Someone sent me uh, an archaeological uh, video explanation of Jericho and this story. I, I found it to be really excellent after I'd studied and then watched it. I thought it just so squares up. But in that video, there's some additional information that was, was shared about Jericho. Now, go back into, I don't know if it would have been your history class or whatever class, but Oftentimes, the way we learn about antiquity is through what they discover at tells. A tell is a mound, and cities have been built on top of cities. So once a city is destroyed, after a period of time, a city gets built on top of it. And then another city gets built on top of it, and another city on top of it. Now, I didn't have time after I saw the video. I should have baked a layer cake for you. I thought it was a fantastic way that they described a tell. And they made a layer cake and just showed each layer of the cake. And the archaeologists do. They come in and they slice the cake in half, if you will. And they look at the internal parts of what they've discovered at each level of the tell. So archaeologists in the early 1900s in excavating the tell that is Jericho, found the layer that we're talking about in Joshua chapter 6 that would have dated to somewhere around 1400-ish, is about when this would have occurred. What they discovered about Jericho is that there was a, a rock containment wall that was, I don't know how high, but it contained an earthen embankment behind it. And then behind that earthen embankment was a, a wall. So there are actually two walls that surrounded Jericho. A mud brick wall was built in addition on top of that rock wall. So if there was a, a tall wall at the front, an earthen embankment in between, and then a taller wall on the inside that protected. So when they shut themselves in in Jericho... They were behind these two walls, about four and a half foot in depth, and then up to 40 feet, uh, perhaps, in height. To give size, it's estimated it was about six acres. Some would say a little higher, but around six. Our church building and parking lot is a little over six acres. So when you think about Jericho, think about our church building in the parking lot. And then think about two to 3,000 people that lived in the city in that time. So two to 3,000 people living in our church building and in the parking lot. That, that's Jericho. So to give context, to give the setting, this is what's happening. Now the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. He reiterates the promise that he had made to Joshua that the land is yours. He just says it again. This is a gracious gift. I'm giving it to you. Uh, and they're best fighting men. You can know I've given them to you. So you can go into this with confidence because you can know I've already promised this is yours. The instructions begin. Here's the plan. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Here's the first part of the plan. We want to understand the plan. Here's the city. You're to take your marching men, the military, and your strategy, the plan, is to walk around the city one time a day for six days. This is the plan I'm laying out for you. So there, Joshua's understanding the plan. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Here's more understanding of the plan. 
there will be seven priests carrying seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. The ark of the covenant is the symbol of the presence of God. So core to this whole mission is God is at the center. At the end of the day, they're not going to be able to say, man, did you see how I took those guys out? Did you see how we knocked that wall down? No, God is at the center of the plan. This is what God is doing. No one else will get credit. This isn't really about the battle at Jericho. It's really not uh, about the obedience of the people, although it is about those things. This is more about God who's at the center of it all. And then we know about the number seven in the Bible is a number for completion. In six days, God created, and on the seventh day, He rested. At the end of Revelation, there are seven churches representing all the churches, complete number. We see it throughout Scripture. Seven priests, seven trumpets. And on the seventh day, the instructions change. You'll actually walk around the city seven times and then blow the trumpets. It shall be in verse 5 that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. This is the plan. Six times you're going to walk around the city in six days, one time a day. The seventh day you're going to walk around it seven times. On the seventh time, you'll actually blow the trumpets. And the trumpet, it's a shofar. And when we think about how the Old Testament points us to the New Testament, one thing we know is going to happen is when Jesus comes back, the trumpets are going to be blasting. And there's going to be shouts of victory as he comes to gather up his own and ultimately take us not into the promised land described here, but into the new heavens and the new earth. Heaven come to earth. Here's the plan. Joshua, do you understand the plan? I don't know what Joshua was thinking when he heard the plan. My hunch is this wasn't what he thought the plan would be. But God had done a number of unusual things, and he trusted him. And he was going to walk in the unusual way that God was leading him. So what about us today? What's the plan? What's God's plan? What's the unusual plan he has for life's battles? One, we need to know who our enemy is. And every one of us in the room and online, we have three three enemies. The first enemy is Satan himself. He's a deceiver, an attacker, a liar, a schemer, <clears throat> he doesn't play fair. He goes after children, he goes after teenagers, he twists truth. He's a formidable enemy, not to be taken lightly with just a t shirt. Our second enemy is what the Bible calls our flesh. And by the flesh, I don't mean our skin, our sinful human flesh. It's our sin nature. That's the way Scripture describes it. That's our second enemy, is our own sin nature, of which every one of us are born with that sin nature, and every one of us express that sin in different and multiple ways. We're on level ground as far as that goes. The third enemy is the world. In 1 John 2.15, we're told to not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In an affluent culture of which we're in, we all need to be really careful about this one. Our affluence can quickly deceive us, distract us, get us away from being centered on God Himself. 
some of those same things that of the world that are not good can be good. It's a matter of what we're doing with them and where are our loves. See, God doesn't share what our affections are with other things. Just like the ark was at the center, He's the center, and we're not to share our affections with things other than God Himself. These are enemies that we all face, and I think that God has put together a really unusual battle plan for us to fight those enemies. Uh, It's not marching around a city six times and then on the seventh day doing it seven times and blowing trumpets, but there may be things God asks of us that are really unusual at times. And I would say the ultimate victory of what he's done is really an unusual way to go at things. Back in the spring, we talked about God's story quite a bit and just trying to get in our minds a big anchoring of the whole Bible. And we talked about, this is God's plan, by the way. So we want to understand thoroughly what God's plan is. And the plan is for God to be at the center. And then in the first chapter of God's big story is creation in Genesis 1 and 2. And in creation, everything is created perfectly. Everything's in harmony with one another. And God is walking among that which he has created. And it's a beautiful Say, beyond anything we can imagine. But sin enters into the world, and there's a second chapter to the story, and it actually cuts us off from God. And we call that the fall. And when sin enters into the world, then that's why there's all the chaos today. That's why we have brokenness. That's why there's these battles against Satan and the the flesh and the world. But there's good news in God's plan, and it's not a way that I think most people anticipated God would bring victory. But it's in this third chapter of his story through the cross and redemption. And I'm not sure you and I would have come up with that idea or that plan. But on that cross, Jesus, the scripture tells us, destroyed the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. And on that cross, he destroyed the works of the devil. Of the sinful flesh. And on that cross, he said, I've overcome the world. And there's a response that's called for in that part of the story, and it's to repent from believing anything else is the way and surrendering to Jesus as the way, as God is. Designed victory to come. When we believe that, the Spirit of God comes within us. Our hearts are made alive. And now our purposes are within God's story and they're centered on God Himself. And we're all aimed at the new heavens and the new earth. Which, by the way, when everything wraps up, we will not be up in heaven. Scripture says at the end of Revelation, heaven is coming to earth. And that which we see now that's stained by sin will be perfectly pure again, just like Genesis 1 and 2. And for those who know Jesus, all eternity will be, eternity will be spent in the new heavens and the new earth. See, that's God's plan. It's an unusual plan. And the scripture says that there's two responses to that plan that people give. It's either foolish Or it's power. So to understand the plan, this is the plan. There's not another plan. This is the plan. And what's important today is what is our response to the plan that God has laid out. If we respond yes to Jesus, then there's a way he's designed for us to live and to walk in victory. We put together a few years ago what we call the eight ways to follow Jesus. We adapted that from our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world who were persecuted for their faith. And they just developed a basic way that they could teach how to be a follower of Jesus because they never knew and never know today 
when someone might get arrested and put in prison. And in order for the church to continue, it's next person up. And this was a way to keep passing down the core things of Christ. It's unusual the way God would call us to live. He said, here's the plan. Make disciples of all the nations. That's the plan. Go out and talk about Jesus and help people be followers of Jesus. That's the plan. And help them to understand, to repent and believe. And then to be obedient and be baptized. That's the plan. And then it's a really odd plan from there. The way you'll actually fight these battles well is to abide in Christ. It's actually to retreat and be with God. And it's to pray. Because it's a spiritual battle, the battle's not against each other. Oh, our culture wants to pit us that direction and fracture and divide, and Satan has masterfully done that. But our battle today is not against flesh and blood. It is in the spiritual realm. The plan is to fight differently than everyone else. And it's to actually rest at the foot of the cross, abide deeply in Christ himself, and fervently pray. That's the plan. And the plan is to serve and give our resources away And take the Lord's Supper to constantly remember what it is that Christ did. That's the plan. Do you understand the plan? So once we understand the plan, we want to execute the plan. This last week, one of our global workers from the Middle East was in town just for a few days to help support a fundraising effort. This particular global worker is in the Middle East. Just, if you can just put the map back in your mind, just a few hours away from Jericho, working among a people, two to four million person people group, spread out among a few countries, several thousand where they are. They're called an unreached people group. And the global worker and a few of her friends, a small number, they understand the plan. And the plan is to make disciples of all the nations. They're there because they understand the plan. God's unusual plan. To send young ladies into some of the hardest places all over the world. That's his plan. And to send young men and husbands and wives with young children in some of the toughest places in the world. It's an unusual plan that God has. So we understand the plan, but the question is when we understand it, will we execute the plan? Not our plan, His plan. Let's anchor ourselves back into the scripture in verse 6 uh, and see how Joshua does this. Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. God told Joshua, this is the plan. Now Joshua's gathering up the priests. He's going to share with them the plan. Anytime God says something to us, he wants us to pass it on. It doesn't stop or terminate with us. It moves on. Joshua moves on with the plan. Uh, then he, in verses 7 and 8, he reiterates what had already been said in understanding the plan. And then verse 9, he says, The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. Here's the setup. There's some 600,000 men that were able to fight. So imagine, 600,000 I don't know what depth that would be just surrounding a space like this building in our parking lot. But at the middle of it, there's a rear guard 
and there's a front guard. In the middle of it are the priests and the ark. Symbol of God. God is the center of this plan. Verse 10, but Joshua commanded the people, saying you should not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you shout, then you shall shout. Six days. Silence. It's marching band of people walking around this fortified city. Not a word. Don't make a noise. Don't shout. Don't talk. This is how to execute the plan. Can you imagine how intimidating that was to those inside Jericho? Thousands upon thousands of people just walking around dead quiet. Silence oftentimes carries way more weight than words. It's a time to be quiet. Psalm 46, 10, it says, Be still and know that I'm God and I'll be exalted among the nations. How will I be exalted? Just be still. Be quiet. Watch what I'm going to do. In verses 11 through 14, they begin to execute the plan, uh, circling and walking around uh, the one time a day for the six days. Then verse 15, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and they marched around the city in the same manner seven times. They're executing the plan. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Uh, The word shout is a Hebrew word that can mean one of two things. It can mean the shout of a battle cry and, and we kind of all have those movies in our mind where there was just uh, these incredible battles and they just start yelling and shouting. And I'm sure that's just part of how you get yourself amped up to, uh, to go attack. Uh, and they're shouting. There's that kind of shout. But it also in the Psalms is a shout of praising God for victory. This is how I fight my battles. Surrounded by you, shouting your praises and singing gratitude to you. It's an unusual battle plan. But they knew, they were confident. God promised them they had the victory. And so they were shouting with that victory. Verse 17 and 18 Scripture talks about, it's a quick little kind of side note here to them. When they're executing the plan, there are certain things that God has banned that they're not to take. They're not to plunder the city. And anyone who covets, that's a sin of the flesh, and takes something from under the ban, there will be a curse on that person, and there will be things that have community-wide implications. Next week... Chapter 7 will deal with what happened as a result of someone not being obedient to God and disobeying and taking something under the ban. But there's a warning here, clarity from God, that when you execute the plan, there's some things that are banned from you. Now, in our own lives with God, when we understand the plan and we're executing the plan, there are things that God says no to. He's not doing that to punish us. He's not doing that to take our fun away. He's doing that to protect and provide for us as a father who loves his children. He knows what's best for you and for me. And there are some things that simply need to be 
expand. We see those all throughout Scripture, and it's so that we might have life. Verse 20, so the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, it says, By faith they came in and took it. They're commended for their faith. The walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith. Faith over fear, faith over failure, faith in God. They went for it. Here's the plan. They're executing the plan. In that, with archaeologists and their discovery, remember I started by saying there was a rock containment wall. There was earthen embankment behind it, held that earthen part in place, and then a wall inside. And on top of that rock containment wall is a tall mud brick wall. In the excava- excavations of the archaeologists, what they found is a wall had fallen outside. And what this means literally is it fell upon itself. So it fell and dropped and it actually made a ramp for them to come up and into the city. That's what they found in the excavation. What's the scripture say? The wall fell down flat. The people went up. They went up into the city Every man straight ahead and they took the city. Archaeological finds again and again verify the truth of Scripture. For for people who wonder, is this historically accurate? Archaeological finds again and again and again verify the fact of Scripture. Our faith is based on the fact of what God has given us. But let's think about those walls for a minute. In 2 Corinthians 10, we're told that God's battle plan for us, there are spiritual walls that are put up against God that consist of lofty thoughts, pride. And so a question we would at least ask ourselves when we think about these walls that were intended to keep the people of God out, are there any walls that you and I have put up against God? Are there walls of pride? Walls of self-centeredness? Walls of anger? Walls of jealousy? Walls of sexual immorality? Are there walls that we've put up that need to come down? And it doesn't matter how hard we try to batter those walls down. We desperately lean into God to tear those walls down. So that as followers of Jesus, one of the unusual ways we fight battles on behalf of someone else is to pray that God will tear down the walls in their life while first asking him to look at the walls that are in my own life. But God, I need you to tear those down. Because I've tried to be patient again and again and again, and for some reason it doesn't work. Because God's way of defeating things that don't work in our lives is not for us to try harder. It's not for today to figure out, I'm going to be patient today. Matter of fact, when we leave the parking lot, I don't care if somebody cuts me off out there, I'm going to be patient today. Until I'm not. But what's God's plan? It's to abide and hang out with Him. And one day we wake up and say, Oh wow, that didn't agitate me like it used to. What happened? It's not because you matured and grew older. There are a lot of older people that are still really angry people. It's because Jesus comes in and transforms lives. 
But that happens as we hang out with Jesus. It's an unusual plan. Most everything else in life is you go figure it out. You go earn it. You go try. You go do this. Now, God's plan is settle in with me. Surround yourself with my presence. Send your praise. Express your gratitude. And watch the walls come down. And we pray and we battle for people in the heavenly places. I don't just try to sit around and figure out how to fix the problem. I'm praying, asking God who can actually fix it to fix it. This is God's plan. I was listening to, uh, I was sent quite a bit this week actually. Someone sent me a lecture that Rosario Butterfield did. She was a lesbian activist in the 90s. Uh, she taught queer theory at Syracuse University. She was a leading spokesperson for what she describes for where we are today. And just fully owns that what she did helped set what is happening today. But through a pastor and his wife and others that loved her and through reading the scripture seven times uh, all the way through, uh, God broke through her heart and she became a follower of Jesus. And she asked God, she said, what do I do now? Uh, I teach queer, I'm a tenured professor of queer theory at Syracuse University. What, what do I do now? God's done a remarkable work in her life, but one of the things she said, one, she speaks passionately about this topic because she feels like she helped set the environment for it. And she said this, and I don't want to be misunderstood, although I suspect I will be. But she said, what I did not need back then was empathy for my sin. What I needed was somebody to step back away from me, throw out a rope with something on there that could save me. She said, where, where has repentance gone today as a way to bring relief to somebody? And if you don't step back and throw out the life raft, who's going to? People were praying for her that the walls of hardness would come down. And ultimately her sin was not being a lesbian or lesbian activism. Her sin underneath all that was a pride. And then it expressed itself that way. But we pray for walls to come down and for people to see that the way to freedom and to rescue is through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. The walls would come down. Hearts be softened and changed. And we watch it happen over and over and over again. Verse 21 is a troubling verse for people. It says, They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. So, in this part, God has said, and he said it in Deuteronomy 20, verses 17 and 18 to them as well. Uh, he said, you shall utterly destroy them, uh, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Here's why. So that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they've done for their gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. Now, this bothers people, and there are other stories that really bother people in the Old Testament because you say, okay, how can God be a good God if he brings this kind of utter destruction on people? That's not a good God, and if that's who God is, then I'm out. That's common today and probably always has been. We'll say, your God is a God of genocide, that's all this is at Jericho. Or it's ethnic cleansing. So how would we respond to that? 
if God did say to utterly destroy everything in the city. We start with the character of God. That God is a just God. God is a holy God. He's absolutely pure in who He is. He's a God who loves. And He's a God whose justice, love and justice, kiss at the cross. Both love and justice happen there. Jesus takes on the wrath of God so we don't have to. But God is a God of justice and he will bring his wrath down, a firm reaction against sin. And in Genesis 15, 16, it says the Amorites who are in Jericho right now, that's who they are. It says their iniquity is not yet completed in Genesis. Meaning their sin has not reached its full point of judgment yet. But God gave the Canaanites centuries to repent and turn to him. And there's a point where finally God says, that's enough. Judgment comes. It says the same thing in Romans 1. The people were worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And there's a point where God says, he gives them over to it. If this is the sin you want, God gives them over. I don't know where that point is, but there is for God. In Ephesians, we're told that we're either objects of mercy or objects of wrath. These are the two choices. God takes sin seriously, and I think if you and I were honest with ourselves today, we all have a sense of justice, and there is a line for all of us to where we believe justice should be served. God is a God of justice, but he's given them centuries to repent, and look what happens with Rahab and her family. In 22 through 25, they're spared. Somebody recommended this book, Why Did God Do That? And it deals with a lot of these hard kind of questions like I just described. So if you're interested in that kind of thing and you're curious yourself because you're thinking, I don't know why God did that. They're, they deal with most of those things. Uh, so great, great. Re- I just read the one chapter about this particular part. The rest of it looks really good to me uh, as well. Rahab spared, that says it's not ethnic cleansing, it's not genocide, it is judgment on sin. That is what it is. And God does it because of what he says in Deuteronomy. It's not just judgment on sin, but if you live among people who are doing child sacrifice, which they did, who are sexually immoral, which they were, then you'll become like them. In Proverbs, it says, or in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. Psalm 1, if you walk in the counsel of the wicked, stay in the path of sinners, sit in the sea of scoffers, you become like them. He was preserving his people. Unfortunately, their sin nature would flow out, and they would do those same sins later anyway. Maybe that helps a little bit. The other thing we find is this chapter wraps up in verse 26. That once the city is burned, which verse 24 says, then anyone will be cursed who rises up and rebuilds the city. Which, by the way, archaeologically, in the way they showed this with the layer cake, they showed this season of Jericho with a burnt piece of layer cake. And in this layer, they, they found burnt pottery and burnt wheat in the pottery. I didn't know wheat would last that long. Why does that matter? Because the Jordan River was at flood stage. This was harvest season. They had just harvested the wheat when the city was burned. There's evidence the walls came down, the city was burned, and then abandoned for centuries after, until finally someone rebuilt it, 
and this curse was on them, it was to be remembered what God had done there. Understand the plan, execute the plan. They executed the plan. Do we understand God's story? Have we responded to it the way God would have us to? And are we executing the plan with obstacles in our own life, obstacles in other people's lives, in the unusual way God would have us to do it? Our global worker friend in the Middle East understands the plan and is executing the plan in a really tough spot where of those two to four million people, there are four known believers. But they believe what God says, to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's execute the plan well. And could I cheer you on from a life group side that was shown today? God's called us to execute the plan in community with one another. Father, thank you for our time uh, in your word today, God. And I pray as we respond uh, in song that your name would be glorified and praised, that we would know the surrounding power and influence of your presence, and that we would well up with gratitude today, God. Whatever the battles are that people are facing today, I pray we'd look at the blueprint in Joshua 6, that we'd understand what your plan is for us in any situation, and God, that you'd give us the strength, the power, and the wisdom to execute the plan. And I pray these things in Jesus' name today. Mark Twain.
let's declare it together. Yes, we believe. Oh, we believe. And we trust in the hands of our Maker. Yes, we believe. We believe. Oh, we trust in the hand. Trust in the hand. We will walk in the footsteps of our Jesus. Alive and well and living. Alive and well and living. We will walk in the footsteps of our Jesus. Alive and well and living. Alive and well and living right here. He's alive. Before Lorraine comes to share a couple announcements, and uh, this being my last Sunday here, I uh, just want to tell you and thank you for the privilege of being your worship pastor these past 22 years. <laughs> and one other thing I wanted to say was, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. God bless you all. Thank you so much. You can have a seat for just a second. Um, well, first, I want to say thank you to David and Diana. Um, thank you for leading us well these last 22 years. Thank you, David, for um, always glorifying the Lord and always moving us to love the Lord and to grow in our love for the Lord and love God, not just with our words, but with our hearts and our minds. It truly has been a privilege to be led by you. So thank you. And to Diana, who is in the back of the room, Thank you. Thank you for loving our kiddos. Thank you for pointing them to the Lord. We are so blessed by both of you and your gifts, so thank you, thank you. And we want to invite all of y'all to join us after the service upstairs, <laughs> oh man, um, to, to say goodbye and to send off these two dear friends. So please join us upstairs. This is my reminder, if you have kids in childcare, you need to please pick them up before you head into the lunch. <laughs> Um, so please grab your kiddos and please join us as we live on these two dear friends and thank them. Um, we announced life groups earlier. If you are interested in connecting into those life groups, um, the life group leaders will be outside in the lobby. You can stop by um, and, and visit with them and meet them on your way to the lunch. Um, there will be people up front who would love to pray with you. If you have filled out a connection card, you can drop that off um, with anyone on our welcome team. And finally, you can continue your active worship by leaving your tithes and offerings on the way out. Thank you so much, and we'll see you upstairs. Y'all have a great Sunday. <laughs>